Hello and welcome to the Spirit of Life program. My name is Lucia Parch and today we have back with us from last week Terry Callagher, who is the Victorian President of the Australian Family Association, an organisation that deals with family values. Welcome back. Thank you for um, accepting our invitation to come back, Terry. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you. Um, perhaps for those viewers that didn't see the interview last week, would you mind just recapping of who you are and what you do? Yes, well, I am, I'm a qualified lawyer. I worked for many years as a, a solicitor. Um, I, I'm a mother of four children, and I have always been, I suppose, in agreement with the the philosophy of the organisations that I now work for. Mm -hmm. um, I moved towards those organisations because I agreed with their aims and and, um, and objectives, um, and was eventually asked to to um, come onto the paid staff of the organisation. So I am a full time employee as Victorian president of the Australian Family Association. Uh, and, and also spokeswoman for the Australian Family Association, so I do, you know, media interviews. Mm -hmm. right. representing and what else does it entail apart from media interviews? Well, we um, collate research. Mm -hmm. um, we have we sometimes, if we ha are able to raise funds, we raise funds for specific research to be done on specific topics. Mm -hmm. um, we, in fact, did uh, research or had research done on the abortion issue quite a number of years ago to look at what the actual understanding of abortion was um, in the community and what people's views and um, beliefs about abortion were. And that was really instrumental to uh, what had the approach that we now take to the abortion situation, which is that... Women need so much support, they need to be offered alternatives when they are in a situation with a, a challenging pregnancy. It might have been unplanned, it might have been planned, but things might happen mm -hmm. um, to realise that we have to work towards rebuilding or towards building a pro-life culture. And in that, we will then be able to perhaps to regulate abortion in the, in the interests of women and, of course, their unborn babies. Mm -hmm because at present um, there's serious concern about the regulation, for example, of abortion clinics. I mean, I think it was 43 women have been infected with hepatitis C oh from an abortion clinic here in Melbourne. Um, from the same, uh, the same clinic, another woman died after a, um, a midterm abortion and another woman suffered multiple organ failure. So we wonder how far it will go before, you know, you get regulation, for example, Indeed. of the um, clinics and of the standard of medical care that women get. But of course, you know, with abortion, we believe because one of the, one of the what we call the uh, principles of the National Civic Council is the protection of human life from conception to, national, to natural death. So we do see abortion as taking a life um, and we are very concerned about that, but you have to see it all in context of what's going on. Indeed. You have to look at all angles. Every well, aspect. all those who are affected. Mm. And we see first and foremost the mother. Mm. And if you support and assist the mother, then you protect the baby. Right. Because the law certainly didn't, even before the decriminalisation. And we, we you know, did work against the decriminalisation of abortion. Mm -hmm. And we still, of course, do not think that was what should have been done. Mm -hmm. Um, but even before that, there were uh, such a number of abortions which were able to be ascertained or estimated that 89% of the Australian population that were interviewed for the survey that we financed said they believed that there were um, too many abortions being done and that women should. They were, you know, they were uneasy about the number of abortions being done and that counselling and support should be offered to women. And uh, when you um, collate those statistics, what do you do with them? Well, though, then uh, we, we use them then in our campaigns and in the information that we try to get out to people. Now, during the 2010 election, we did put out specifically flyers um, 
uh, about the abortion issue because it was definitely the issue that was really the low point, I think, that has led to a resurgence of uh, pro-life people from across the religious spectrum and even those with no particular religious belief, but mainly religious believers, mm -hmm. um, that we're really starting to all talk to each other, you know, Catholic and Protestant denominations, Jewish. Um, we're trying to make inroads into the Muslim community because we all actually share these values so it's a uniting... to talk about what, we, what needs to be done, what can be done. Terry, it seems based on what you're saying, this um, pro-life issue has a uniting effect on the different faith structures or faith um, backgrounds. Would, well, would yes, uh, it, it has had. Um, we went out to find out, we go out to find out what's there, what people's views are. Um, you know, we don't make it up, but we thought, look, it's so bad. And there, there was um, a great despondency after the passing of the Abortion Law Reform Act. And that was where we first began to touch base with other denominations, other Christian denominations. And so we decided in the run up to the 2010 election that we would reach out to those churches and see would they respond, you know, and that was a platform mm -hmm. um, that we were going to run. And we did, we lobbied very hard and we put out uh, leaflets during that election campaign mm -hmm. um, and we targeted politicians who had voted for the Abortion Law Reform Act. And I'm not apologising for that at all. The Abortion Law Reform Act allows abortion to nine months. And a lot of people don't know that, and I think they would not like it. So there might be different, um, you know, there's room for differences of opinion, but there are certain aspects of it, huge aspects of that legislation that we all share an abhorrence to, the late-term abortions, partial birth abortion, um, so we found a resonance in the other denominations and we went into the Jewish community. We made some contacts there. Um, and we find, yes, that there is um, a united concern on the abortion issue. You know, the work you're doing seems um, fantastic because you're providing education, information to those people that otherwise may not know about what goes on behind the scenes. Yes. Um, on that note, we're going to take a break and I'll be back. We'll see you back soon. Welcome back. My guest today is Terry Kelleher, the Victorian President of the Australian Family Association. Hi, Terry. Uh, Terry, just before the break, we talked about the um, valuable work that you're doing in informing the public and yes. educating. Yes, and that is one of the things that we wish to do. Mm -hmm. um, now, in relation to the abortion issue, a lot of people we found didn't know what the Act provides and didn't know the sorts of things that had been, the amendments that had been knocked back, you know, to provide pain relief to babies during late-term abortions, um, uh, partial birth abortions being banned. That's uh, not just simply in a humane society. It's, it's not tolerable. And all people of goodwill w would agree with these things. You know, it really is a, a, a dreadful piece of legislation. The other aspect is um, medical professionals are, and that includes uh, well, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, they are denied their freedom of conscience. Their freedom of conscience is violated in relation to abortion. A doctor who is approached must refer a woman to another doctor he knows doesn't have a conscientious objection to abortion. That is a doctor who does have a conscientious objection. Now, that is not acknowledging or allowing freedom of conscience Indeed. on the part of those doctors to have their view of abortion. So it, it really is... It's still a um, form of imposition. Oh, it's a, it's a denial of a right. The, in fact, the International Covenant Declaration of Human Rights uh, and the um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights actually um, specifically acknowledges the right to freedom of conscience and freedom of belief. And yet in relation to abortion, it's specifically denied and the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act here in Victoria, which also sets out rights and sets out the right to conscience of people and belief, specifically excludes any 
legislation or any law in relation to abortion. So in relation to abortion, there's no freedom of conscience. And that brings me to a current campaign that we're running. We began to see on these different life issues, you know, abortion, euthanasia, um, embryonic stem cell research. In all of these issues, we were seeing them separately as separate issues to be fought. But it became more apparent that there's actually a huge battlefront and that what's happening is that there is a legislative attack on freedoms, basic freedoms. Mm. And this is across the Western world. Um, you know, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, I can give you examples of cases where people who have, you know, a conscience or a particular belief are being denied the freedom to act in accordance with that belief, or they're being denied the right to, to show their belief in public. But isn't that a form of discrimination in reverse? Well, we think that it is, yes, yes. but it's all done under the guise of human rights mm -hmm. and anti-discrimination legislation. Mm. And that's precisely the point that we're trying to make. Mm. And we have a current campaign, a Free to Believe campaign, which we're running, which is specifically addressing this legislative attack across the board on fundamental freedoms. Now, there are numbers of pieces of legislation. There's um, the anti-discrimination legislation. There was the Equal Opportunity Act here in, in Victoria. There, there are um, hate crimes legislation, ra racial and religious tolerance act here in Victoria. They all sound very good, but they don't operate in the way that people think they will. What it is, is that it denies people who have a conscience um, the right to, to actually exercise. act in accordance with their conscience. And that's yes. what we, we are explaining in these information sessions that we're running. We've already run two in country Victoria and we're going to run them around Victoria and then probably our branches in other states will run them to show that this legislative attack, and it is worldwide. For example, I can give you some examples if you like. Yes, please. Um, it seems, uh, it becomes very obvious that it's um, very off balance, very one-sided. And in this legislative um, uh, issues that you're discussing with me here, it's uh, it's really um, them imposing on, as you say, the freedom for us to have a, a decision based on our thoughts or theologies or, or philosophies. We're, it's it's actually being imposed on us, really, isn't it? Yes, it is, in the guise of human rights and yes. anti discrimination. Yes, which actually means what it means then is that the the inalienable rights of human beings which were acknowledged in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which includes freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief, um, they have been actually made conditional. Sometimes you'll have it, but in other contexts you won't. Mm. So you may have freedom of conscience um, you know, in some cases, but not in relation to abortion. Mm. And it's not just abortion. You look at euthanasia. Now, the latest act... Um, that was sought to be passed to, uh, to allow euthanasia was in South Australia about a month ago or six weeks ago. It had a clause in it, very similar to the clause in the Victorian Abortion Act, saying that doctors who were approached about providing euthanasia to a patient, if the doctor didn't wish to do it, um, could inform the patient that there was another practitioner who may do it. Oh. Now, that is a violation of the doctor's conscience. It's not unlike the abortion issue. You know, well, what, I'm, what we're saying is we began to realise we're not dealing with the abortion issue, no. euthanasia. No, no. Um, they're not separate issues. No, no. It's across it's the, the board. It's the agenda of, of um, taking away and the it's freedom all a matter of, of It's all a matter of defining rights. Yes. Where do rights come from? Yes. Well, if they don't come from some source beyond human beings, then mm. they're just human rights. Mm. I mean, you know, and human beings will frame them. Mm. So you can be given rights under a lovely charter or bill of rights, but the government has given them to you so the government can take them away Indeed. or can restrict them or put conditions on them. Mm. Whereas the Universal Declaration of Human Rights after the atrocities of the Second World War mm. was there to actually acknowledge there are inalienable rights, ones that cannot be taken away. You know, they are the right of every human person and have to be, to be um, um, you know, have to be acknowledged by all sovereign governments. But for a human agency such as the parliament to decide, well, these are the rights um, and, and, and you may exercise them freely, uh, except in relation to, for example, you know, this issue or that one, that means that, that a human agency can take away your rights. And we know, of course, 
believers know, well, no, you can't take away our right of conscience if we really yes. think that there's something. And when rights, the issue of rights becomes conditional, right, it's no longer a right. No. <laughs> and on that note, we need to go to another break. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. My guest today is Terry Callagher, the Victorian President of the Australian Family Association. Terry, just before the break, you were talking about the violation of human rights and um, the attack on our fundamental freedom yes. of choice. Yes, yes. Um, could you, do you have some specifics, um, of yes. current specifics of examples um, that you can illustrate your point further for us? Please. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, now, the types of legislation under which this occurs are human rights legislation, equal opportunity, anti-discrimination, um, same-sex marriage um, legislation. I can give examples from Britain. Now, in Britain, under human rights legislation, there are numerous cases every year. Um, I can just give four examples. Nadia Awida, she was a British Airways worker, was told she could not wear her cross necklace at work. Lillian Ladele was, is a marriage registrar. She was disciplined for refusing to conduct same-sex civil partnership ceremonies. Um, Gary McFarlane, I'm, I'm giving the names so you know mm -hmm. they're real people. Mm -hmm. And you can also go to it's the public, Christian public. Legal Centres. If you Google that, you will find these are just a few of their cases that they handle every year. Um, Gary McFarlane was a, rela a relationship counsellor. He was sacked by a counselling service for not giving sex therapy counselling to a gay couple because, you know, that was... It, his um, conviction was that he couldn't do that, that it would, not, it would be immoral. Mm. It um, not that he thing. had anything against the couple, but he's yeah. not going to give them sex advice, yeah. you know, that, the actual, uh, that is immoral. Shirley Chaplin, a nurse, was banned from working on hospital wards after refusing to, re to remove her cross necklace. In the US, uh, New Mexico, a young Christian photographer was fined $7,000 under a Human Rights Act for politely declining to photograph a lesbian commitment service. Then when it goes to, this, to the um, point where same-sex marriage has been legislated, you get even more, uh, an even more direct attack. Um, we'll all be affected if that is the case. Now in Denmark, uh, the new marriage law requires the established Evangelical Lutheran Church to provide a minister for same-sex marriage ceremonies. If one minister doesn't want to do it, the bishop has to provide a minister who will do it. That has completely taken away the authority of the church because the teaching authority of the church rests in the bishop. And what if the bishop says, but oh, I can't do that, it just violates my conscience, and I wouldn't even allow one of my ministers to perform such a ceremony, even if he were willing to do so. It's a complete violation it's of conscience. It's scary, really, isn't it? Yes. And here in Australia, we, you know, we are facing the reform marriage bills before the um, same-sex marriage bills before the federal parliament. And, it, you know, the churches are being thrown a crumb. Oh, well, we'll have a religious exemption, so you won't have to do it. But... There were seven Labor senators who dissented from the Senate report on the same-sex marriage bill saying an exemption is a hollow, it's, it's just hollow, it's not of any substance because of course it can be overruled. And here you see in Denmark they've already actually put into law that the, at least the established Evangelical Lutheran Church must perform same-sex marriage ceremonies. Um, in Ontario in Canada the, following the legalisation of same-sex marriage, the, Ottawa, the Ontario government this year passed the Accepting Schools Bill, which forces all schools, that is state, religious and independent, to allow gay, straight student clubs in their schools. Oh so that is by law. And it follows on from the same-sex marriage legislation because once you legislate it, it's legal, therefore it's OK, therefore you cannot discriminate by not allowing these sorts of clubs. Can you see how it follows? Oh, indeed, they're infiltrating. That's the way in which it follows. Society and attacking it from every direction. By legislation. It's a legislative attack. Yes. And it might not appear on the surface. You know, no. if you, 
I know a lot of people think, well, you know, marriage equality, yeah, you know, we agree with that, um, but there is equality. It tends there is equality. To, we, Terry, we, what I'm sensing now is it tends to leave you powerless as a citizen. What do you say in that? What, what, what can we do? Well, I mean... What can we do? We're running these free-to-believe sessions, so the first thing is to become informed. I can't give you, you know, as much information as I would like to now in the short time we have. But come along to one of our free-to-believe information sessions and then you make your own mind up. Mm -hmm. But at least you will have the background and you'll understand the point being made, how these otherwise very uh, positive-sounding laws... I mean, we all want human rights. Of course we all want to protect human rights. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, we all want equal opportunity. We all do not want un un um, unfair discrimination. But of course, anti-discrimination is not unfair discrimination. It's discrimination against those the state decides should not mm. be discriminated against. Mm. And it may actually act unfairly mm. on those um, who'll be, whose conscience may be affected by yes, it. So it's discrimination in reverse then? Yes. For example, you know, under anti-discrimination legislation, uh, religious schools and organisations could be forced to employ teachers mm. who are not, um, you know, in agreement with the school's ethos and values. Um, so it actually works in reverse, yes. Oh, it's very scary. It really is very Come scary. Come along to our Free to Believe sessions. Now, where, where are these uh, Free to Believe well, sessions Well, you can held? go to family, www.family.org.au mm -hmm. and you will get um, you know, uh, the information, the advertisements for where they're being held. Engagements, yes. okay. Now, is there anything of a particular concern for you at the moment? in this work that you're doing? Um, yes, a big concern looking to the future is young people and getting young people on board. I think because the education system, um, I think, has separated children from their parents and from their parents' values. Mm -hmm. We're very concerned that young people learn to understand what's actually happening mm -hmm. um, and that they not be taken in by simple slogans like, you know, marriage equality and, um, you know, without really investigating what, what, what actually that means. So we have some young people coming on and we are, um, you know, giving them positions of responsibility. And, but we do need a lot more young people to, to come on board. Well, Terry, we've come to the end of our program. And all I want to say to you is that you've given us a lot of food for thought and you are an exemplary ambassador. And thank you for all the good work you're doing uh, for human rights. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. And the family. It's been a pleasure. You've been watching the Spirit of Life program. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place. Take care. Bring it.